In the last part, we have seen interaction of distribution stress field with uh, solute atoms, whether they are interstitial or substitution solute atoms. Now we'll be looking at implication of these interactions, that is interaction between a stress field of a dislocation with interstitial solute atoms in case of mild steel, which leads to an yield point phenomenon. So we have got introduced to yield point phenomena when we discussed about stress strain engineering curves for different materials. And we have got introduced to two terms that is upper yield point and lower yield point. And we'll be looking at this in more detail in this class. So we have a mild steel, which is well annealed. And what do I mean by well annealed? So we have a dislocation density range to be of order of 10 to the power 7 per centimeter square. And we have interstitial solute atoms. So when I talk about mild steel, so what is the weight percent of this carbon or nitrogen, which are interstitial solute atoms in iron, alpha iron, that is, it is less than or equal to 0.25 weight percent. Now this carbon and nitrogen, these are oversize interstitial solute atoms. And we have seen when we have oversize interstitial solute atoms, the delta V, its change in the volume, the speed volume will be more, that is delta V will be positive. And let us write in terms of an interaction energy, it is EI is equal to minus sigma M into delta V. And we have seen that this is now positive in case of carbon and nitrogen. And thus, this is sigma M, which is hydrostatic stress field around an H dislocation. And when the sigma M is positive, this EI, that is interaction energy, will be negative. So thus, let's say, let me write it down. When sigma M to be positive, that is means it is tensile in nature. So where we have tensile stress field around H dislocation, so we'll have tensile stress field around this location. So here it will be positive. So carbon atom or nitrogen atoms, these interstitial solute atoms will occupy positions which are below the slip plane of these H dislocations. Now let's look that here in the schematic. So we have an H dislocation here and we have slip plane and these carbon atoms will occupy these positions because the interaction energy EI will be negative at this place for this for these H dislocations and solute atom interactions. And these interactions of this carbon or nitrogen interstitial solute atoms with dislocation will bring down the energy of dislocations. As we know that these dislocations will be associated with some energy and this segregation of carbon atoms to the core of this dislocation below the slip plane will bring down the energy of this dislocation and thus we need a high amount of stress to move this dislocation now and that is why we get a strengthening in case of segregation which is happening at the core of this dislocation. Now let's look at this condition in more detail. So we have crystal over here. Let's mark an edge dislocation with a bias vector in this direction. Let's mark an extra half plane. So let's consider this is a dislocation and let's consider this is to be a specific slip plane. And let's consider this are interstitial atoms which are carbon and nitrogen and this we I can call it as a field of point defects. And if I give sufficient time or temperature, let me write it down. So if I have sufficient time and temperature, what will happen? This carbon atoms will try move near to this dislocation or try to diffuse to the core of this dislocation below this slip plane as because here this interaction energy is negative. So this carbon atoms will move here and get accumulated near the core of dislocation below the slip plane and this kind of atmosphere or what I can say this kind of accumulation of carbon atoms near the core of dislocation is called as cotteral atmosphere. So this atmosphere of solute atoms around the dislocation is called as cotteral atmosphere. It is also called as cotteral bilby cloud. So we have this cotteral atmosphere which formed around this H dislocation and because of this atmosphere, it will be difficult to move this dislocation in the lattice and we'll be seeing its implication on yield point phenomena. Mind you, we will not see this kind of formation of cotteral atmosphere in case of dilute substitution solid solutions. Now let's look at this 
effect of quartal atmosphere and its implication in forming yield point phenomena in case of mild steel. So to find out yield point phenomena or to understand yield point phenomena, let's find out a stress strain curve for this mild steel. So we have stress on y axis, strain on x axis and to find out a stress strain curve for any material, any engineering material, what we do is a tensile test at a constant standard. So we do test that constant standard to find out stress strain behavior. Now let's consider this slip plane, let's consider this dislocation and let us consider these solute atoms in this distributed in this crystal and let's consider this dislocation and around which we have a quarter atmosphere that is formation of or segregation of this interstitial solute atoms around the core of dislocation below the slip plane. So we have this formation of quarter atmosphere and when you try to move this dislocation under the influence of stress what you can see is that the stress necessary to move this dislocation is less than the stress required to unlock them. Let us write that down here. So we have this stress required to glide for this dislocation is smaller than the stress required to unlock them. So what we have to do when we, when we want this dislocation to glide, we have to apply this kind of stress that is to unlock them first. So first we have to unlock them. So this can be seen or reflected in this engineering stress strain curve. So we need a stress to a higher value to unlock these dislocations from the quartal atmosphere and we reach to the point here. So when we reach to this point, which is sufficient enough to unlock this dislocation, this dislocation will set free from this quartal atmosphere. And let's say this dislocation gets set free and it moves. And this dislocation will glide with a higher velocities. Why? Because this stress which is required to glide this dislocation is much smaller as compared to the stress required to unlock this dislocation. So once this dislocation is unlocked, you don't need a higher stress to move this dislocation or to glide this dislocation. And thus, you have a stress drop here which is occurring because you don't need a higher stress to move this dislocation because it has set free from this quartal atmosphere. And thus, you don't need higher stress and the stress will drop to this point and the deformation will progress in this way. So we call these two points as upper yield point and lower yield point. So we have these two points, upper yield point and lower yield point. And this drop in stress is called as yield drop. Now we'll be looking at why this yield drop occurs. So we have seen that the deformation is occurring at a constant strain rate and we have derived this relation where we have related strain rate is equal to dislocation density into Burgess vector into velocity, average velocity of dislocations. So we have seen this relation or we have derived this relation. Now what is happening at upper end point? Once this dislocation set free from this quartal atmosphere, the velocity of these dislocations increases tremendously. So this term increases tremendously. Also, you have a tau glide which is smaller than tau unlock. So this, when these dislocations moves, they will generate more dislocations. And that is why the dislocation density will also increase at this point upper yield point and at upper yield point you have this term rho v is increasing and as we have constraint that is strain rate is constant because our UTM is working at constant strain rate and thus to maintain the strain rate constant what it does it drops down the stress so when the stress decreases strain also comes down and when strain comes down the strain rate will also come down. So you have the stress decrease because we have this condition that is we are deforming material at constant strain rate and it drops down to a lower yield point. And that is why we see these two points that is upper yield point and lower yield point which is a feature of stress strain curve of mild steel. I will be looking at this region. So this region is a plateau here and here this region is called as yield point elongation. So we have plateau, so that means 
let me mark here so as i go on deforming the material you don't need a higher stress more or less stress remains constant so we have constant stress here which is required to cause an elongation or a deformation i will be looking at this why this is happening so this region that is plateau is called as ill point elongation what is happening in this region so we have different scenarios here which is marked here so you have sample and you have a deformation which is occurring in this region which is marked as yellow and this is called as a luders band so these bands which are formed are called as luders band so where the deformation starts and this region which is in blue color is undeformed region so we have an inhomogeneous deformation which is occurring in, in the sample so we have deformation starting at this locations and this luder band will propagate in this way let me mark here on the sample so this luder band will propagate in this way and it progresses in this fashion let's say at this region you have more luder band coming in at third point here you have more luder band coming in at this location where luder band will occupy entire gauge line so we have this region where the deformation occurring so that is a deformed region and i term this region as undeformed region so the propagation of this deformed region will be in this way where the deformation is concentrated in the luder band and let me explain it to you why this is happening so we have this polycrystalline material that is the steel which we are taking that is mild steel which we are taking is a polycrystalline so we have different grains which are oriented in different way and remember a schmidt's law so this let's say this grain which is oriented favorably with respect to tensile axis let us mark here so here let's say the schmidt factor for this grain is higher as compared to this grain as compared to this grain the schmidt factor is higher so deformation will start in this grain and when this deformation will start so let's say you have a dislocation here in this case and let's say these dislocations are pinned with the solute atoms or let's say because of the quaternary atmosphere these dislocations can't move and you need a very high stress which you applied as upper yield point and once this stress is reached in this grain these dislocations will move will move with a very high velocity we have seen this and when they move with a very high velocity what happens they will move and will be stopped at the grain boundaries so when they get stopped at the grain boundaries they will kind of create a back stress or a stress concentration on the neighboring grain and they form a stress concentration and this stress increase in stress will assist this dislocations to move or to set free from the quaternary atmosphere let us write that down so when this stress concentration here you have you have stress concentration will add up with the external applied stress so i will write it here as stress applied and this will assist this dislocation to move or to set free from quaternary atmosphere which is present in this grain so what exactly is happening you don't need a high amount of stress to set free these dislocations in the neighboring grain because of the stress concentration present at the grain boundaries in this grain so we have grain boundaries here and the dislocations will move so we have stress concentration due to accumulation of dislocation which unlocks the dislocation in the neighboring grains and thus you don't need a very high stresses to move dislocations now so once the dislo once the deformation starts in this grain it can assist the deformation in the neighboring grain and that is why this scenario is represented here with this one region so where you have yellow region so this kind of grains will start deforming first and now they will assist the grains in the undeformed region and that is how the propagation will happen so you have this stress at this stress or you need a lower stress to cause set free of these dislocations in the neighboring grain 
Now, why do we have these undulations? Because some of the dislocations will encounter these carbon atom seconds or cotrel atmosphere again, and you need somewhat higher amount of stress to set them free again. So let me explain it to you. So you have, let's say, in this case, these dislocations will move, and when they move, they will again encounter carbon atoms, and again you need somewhat higher amount of stress. And when they again set free, the stress will drop down. So you have this kind of phenomena occurring at this region. So that's why you have undulations here in this L point elongation region. And once these lunar bands occupy the entire gauge lane, the deformation will proceed in a homogeneous way. So we have homogeneous deformation occurring in the sample. Why I am calling this as inhomogeneous deformation? Because the sample is not deforming homogeneously. So it is deforming in this place or in this place and in this place, which is represented by lunar span. And we have seen this phenomena. Why is it happening? Because some of the grains will be oriented favorably with respect to tensile axis and thus you have a localized deformation which propagates in the form of lunar bands and once it occupies the complete gauge length then the material start deforming uniformly or homogeneously rather now let's see practically how this lunar bond forms so let's look at this video So we have a sample tensile sample which is being deformed and you can see there will be formation of lunar bands here. So you can see there is a formation of lunar band and these lunar bands will form more or less at an angle of 45 degrees with respect to tensile axis. And you can correlate that with the Schmidt law why this happens at 45 degrees. And now you can see that these lunar bands are propagating in this way. So this band is propagating in this way and the bottom band is propagating towards the top side. And once it completely occupies the entire gauge length, the material will start homogeneously deforming. So we have this kind of deformation, formation of lunar bands in the material. Now at higher magnifications, you can see here there is a formation of a lunar band and it is propagating in this way. So you can see the formation of lunar bands and propagating in this way. Now look, look at this region where the lunar band has have formed so the deformation will be localized in this region and then it tries to propagate or tries to deform or assist the deformation in these regions which is which are undeformed regions that's how the lunar bands will propagate and once this lunar bands cover entire region of the gauge length you will have a homogeneous deformation which is occurring now let's move further And let's look at some of the important phenomena that is the strain aging here. So for that we have the stress strain curve for a mild steel and let's consider a dislocation or scenario where this dislocation is pinned by this cotral atmosphere and you apply a stress to set free this dislocation from the cotral atmosphere and you see this kind of phenomena which is yield point phenomena we have seen these two points what is happening at these two points what is happening in this region and what is happening here also so we have seen that here there is a formation of lunar bands and once it covers the entire region of the sample you have this homogeneous deformation occurring we have seen why these lunar bands also form why there is a yield drop here we have seen all this now what you do is that when you deform the material in this way now you restrain it again you try to deform it again and what happens after a short duration let's say if you deform in the material without giving much time so you get these dislocations which are already set free from this cotal atmosphere can move and thus you don't see some kind of yield point phenomena here so we we'll don't observe yield point phenomena here 
when you deform material immediately after it is unloaded. Now let's say that this same PAM sample, if you have deformed and you allow it for a certain time and temperature, let me write that down. So let's say you give sufficient time and temperature. If it is sufficient, then what happens? These dislocations will again pin by carbon atoms because carbon atoms will get sufficient time to diffuse to the core of the dislocation and thus they can form a quadrilateral atmosphere again. So if after long duration, if you are try to deforming it, what is happening? These carbon atoms will again form a quadrilateral atmosphere and again you need a higher amount of stress to unlock them. And then again you can see that the yield point phenomena has come back on the sample. So if you deform material immediately after the deformation, that is after short duration, you don't see an yield point phenomena. But if you allow it for a long time, or let's say if you keep it for a sufficient temperature and time, then again you can see an yield point phenomena. And this returning of yield point phenomena is called a strain aging. So this is what is mentioned here. So if after stressing through the yield point, a crystal is unloaded, so we have unloaded the crystal and restrained it immediately, the yield point does not return. So here in this case, we have immediately restrained the material, so it, there will not be any formation of yield point. On the contrary, if the crystal is rested for a long time at room temperature or at elevated temperature, so we have temperature region which is also mentioned here, the yield point returns on subsequent restraining yield point will return because the carbon atoms here will get sufficient time or energy to diffuse to the core of this dislocation and they can form a quarter atmosphere again and thus the yield point returns and this phenomena is called strain aging. Now let's look at another effect because of interaction of dislocations with the solute atoms, interstitial solute atoms in mild steel that is Port Wynn Lee Shackler effect. So in this effect, you can see we, we have a stress strain curve and at room temperature, you get this kind of behavior and at higher temperatures, let's say at 373 Kelvin or 473 Kelvin, you get this serrated yielding. This is serrated yielding which is occurring at these temperatures. And if I again increase the temperature, then we don't see this serrated yielding. So you can see that as I go on increasing the temperature, the yield strength is dropping. Let me write that down here. So temperature increases, yield strength decreases. So this is what is happening here. And in this regime of temperatures, that is from 373 to 473 Kelvin, you get serrated yielding. And why is that happening? So we have this serrated yielding because of continuous locking and unlocking of dislocations because of carbon atoms. So here there is a reason mentioned over here. So at these temperatures, the solute atoms are sufficiently mobile to be able to migrate to moving dislocations and pin them. The dislocations in turn repeatedly break away from the air atmospheres. This repeated locking and unlocking of dislocations results in serrated yielding. Now let's understand this. Let me write it down. So we have let's say a dislocation here and which moves because we are applying stress and now let's say you have sufficient temperature. So what will happen? The carbon atoms, let me use another color. So you have carbon atoms here. So this dislocation is moving. Now this carbon atom can diffuse at these temperatures and form quadrilateral atmosphere. So we have quadrilateral atmosphere forming and to break away from this quadrilateral atmosphere, what you need is that you need some amount of higher stress. So let's say let me mark here. So let's say you have stress and you need a higher amount of stress to unlock these dislocations or set free this dislocation from quadrilateral atmosphere. And once it is set free, it can move freely again. Okay. And then it, the stress required to move will be lower. Again, this carbon atom can diffuse to the core of these dislocations and again the stress required to stress required to unlock will increase and again it decreases. So you get this kind of serrations which are forming in case of mild state. So why is this happening at these temperatures? So what is happening here? The velocity of these dislocations and the diffusion rate of these carbon atoms. 
So carbon atoms can easily catch these dislocations. So this diffusion rate and the velocity of dislocation matches somehow and that is why they can continuously lock these dislocations again and you need somewhat higher amount of stress to unlock this dislocation and that is why we get this stereotypically. What happens at higher temperatures? At higher temperatures the dislocation velocities are higher as compared to carbon atoms and thus they cannot lock or unlock uh, these dislocations and that is why we don't get a serrated yielding at higher temperatures and what is happening at room temperature so here at room temperature the diffusion rate of carbon atoms will be much much lower that is why they cannot they cannot migrate easily towards the dislocation and that is why you don't get serrated yielding even at room temperature however this phenomena is observed both in case of non ferrous and ferrous materials so you have you can observe this phenomena in brass or aluminum alloys also and it can be observed both in single crystal and polycrystal materials so this is what the portwin lee shatler effect which is continuous locking of these locations at certain temperatures by our interstitial solute atoms now let's look at another effect here so we have marked two units of alpha iron let me write that down so we have marked two units of alpha iron and you can see the positions of carbon atoms here these are at the edges and at the face centers so these are all octahedral voids we have seen that these carbon atoms in alpha iron will occupy octahedral voids and these positions are at the face centers and at the edge centers these positions are for iron that is at the corners and one is at the body center now let's say you apply a stress here along c axis so what will happen you will have a let me write that down so we have a expansion along c direction and you have contraction along x and y direction you have c direction where you have expansion and in x and y you have contraction so what's an implication of this what will be an implication of this so this direction it gets contracted this too so this carbon atoms these carbon atoms at these edges parallel to x and y direction will move to the locations or edges which are parallel to z direction let me explain that to you so when this get contracted so this atom will try to prepare to come to this position or this atom will try to come to this location or at this location so carbon atom will prefer locations which are parallel to z direction and this effect is called as noic effect so we have carbon atoms which will preferentially occupy these positions which are parallel to z direction because of expansion and contraction experienced by these crystals so the interstitial atoms will move to the sides along c axis and let's say when you apply a stress along one one direction that will not result in the site change because it causes equal contraction and expansion for in all three directions like x y and z and thus you will not see any result in the change of sites for carbon atoms now let's understand what is its implication with respect to oscillatory stresses so let's say we have an oscillatory stresses let's say we have tension compression along z direction so what will happen because of this so when we have tension along z direction so these sides will be preferred which are parallel to z axis along z axis but when there is a compression this carbon atom will move so this movement is with a very short distance moment so it is it will move to these locations so when you have compression along z direction so this carbon atom will prefer to go along x or y directions you have oscillatory stresses which causes a change in side of these carbon atoms now let me put a question to you would you expect to observe the snowic effect in gamma iron if yes why yes if no why no 
so find it out for yourself now with this i will stop here